the Board of Health for October 15, 2018. Uh, let's stand up and start the meeting with the pledge, of course. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you everyone for showing tonight. We have a, um, we definitely have a quorum tonight, which is nice. I think we're, we are short one member, correct? And I sent you uh, some information about the people that sent in. Oh, you did? Yeah. We got to talk. There's some email issues. I think that's, <laughs> I'm still on there as a net or, a, or, a, or an org rather than a com. So we'll, we'll figure that out before the night's out and we'll get the information going. All right. So let's just take a look at the September meeting minutes. I think I had just one small correction at the end of one that I, that I saw, but everything else looked for pretty, pretty okay to me. So the last item on new business, um, I just not, noticed some flu vaccine. I'm not sure what that in parentheses meant, so we'll just eliminate that. Live. It's available. Live, I think. Oh, live. Oh, uh, it's actually not even live anymore, so it's a, we'll just eliminate that, that line there. Flu vaccine is available. Get it as soon as possible. Anybody else have any other changes or issues or concerns with that? And for future minutes, we can leave off um, absent Mr. McCaffrey because he's no longer on the board. Okay. No other additions, subtractions, anything else? Anybody move to approve the minutes? So move. Moved. Second. second. There's a second. We'll vote on that. All in favor of the minutes being posted on the website and approved? Aye. Any nays? We're good. Okay, so we'll put that on the website. Oh, I missed my block. There we go. All right, so that's set inside. All right, next up we'll have the uh, health officer's report, please. Good evening. We had 54 food safety inspections this past month. We had 12 pool inspections. Uh, we had the Radnor Fall Festival that was on September 16th. The Fall Harvest and Pumpkin Patch event was October 7th. And we had the um, employee flu shot that took place October 11th. Uh, a few public health concerns that came in, some calls came into our department regarding mold, um, specifically black mold. We don't regulate it on the local level and the state doesn't regulate it much either. So I guess I just wanted to mention it to see if you guys had any information that we can kind of share with the residents um, as far as health concerns. Um, I also met with uh, Superintendent Flanagan and the Delaware County District Attorney, Kat Copeland, along with a parent group, Radnor Network to Prevent Gun Violence. The group raised money to purchase gun locks. Um, they want to offer them at local police departments as well as organize and designate a safe gun turn-in day. The DA also um, is matching the money that they raised up to $1,000 for the purchase of gun locks. The, the goal of the parent group is to promote uh, gun control and safety in our schools, and they hope to have a kickoff day in the future where they can get those gun locks out. Um, other ideas presented in the meeting were a link between gun violence, mental health, and sleep deprivation. Uh, they talked about Be Smart, which is a campaign to reduce, uh, reduce child gun deaths. Uh, their website is besmartforkids.org. Uh, this was a pretty, pretty interesting site. They offer resources and tools along with ideas on how to begin the conversation about gun safety with our kids. And finally, we had a workplace safety meeting that took place at the Radnor Firehouse, and Joe McGuire did a presentation on fire safety. And um, afterwards, we kind of went out and did our uh, demo on fire extinguishers. So that was new for me. And that's it. Thanks so much, Marie. Appreciate it. All right, so we'll start with some um, old slash new business. The old business was that we were inquiring with the high school to get some new students for the year for um, our Board of Health uh, sort of internship, and uh, we seem to have some success. Introduce these young gentlemen here. Thank you, Dr. Foreman. Uh, we had several candidates apply, and uh, Dr. Shartz Hopko and myself uh, selected uh, Lois Minning and Philip Kaplan. So we're thrilled that they're going to be joining us for this year in 2019. And I was hoping each one of them could talk a little bit about their letter, their accomplishments so far in high school, and their um, ideas and goals for the uh, Board of Health internship. So congratulations. Thank you. 
in my letter, I talked about how I am a three season runner. And between those seasons, there's different uh, distances that I run. And in the fall, I run cross country, which is a uh, long distance, of course. Uh, in the winter, I run winter track and I do sprints mainly. And then in the spring, I do hurdling. And the difference between all those is uh, the training that you do. And many of my teammates overtrain and it causes a lot of injury. But with my experience, I kind of know how to deal with changing your focus physically and preventing injury. Uh, what I want to get out of this is a great opportunity for me to understand how public government works. And I someday might want to run for public office of any sort, which is one of my dreams in life. So this is a great start for me, being just a junior in high school, at Radnor High School. And uh, pass it on to... All right. Phillip. Thank you, Lois. Excellent. All right, Philip. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm a junior at Radnor High School, and my name is Philip Kaplan. Uh, for most of my life, I've been interested in biology and health-related issues, so I thought this would be kind of an excellent opportunity to get experience with the process, uh, speaking about different issues in the community, and I also thought it would be a good opportunity to contribute to the Radnor community as well. Uh, I'm a swimmer, uh, swim for Radnor High School, and I also do club swimming for Radnor Aquatic Club. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we're really, really excited you're going to be part of the Board of Health this year. Thank you. Super. So we'll, we'll be talking further about, um, you know, ideas for projects for the year for you guys to kind of educate the community. We've had some interesting, great projects in the past that have really uh, been an asset to uh, our just, I, th I think, as board members, things we've learned and also for the community. Um, and uh, you have great resources up here on the board to um, certainly discuss your projects with, um, with uh, kind of a variety of professions in the medical and, um, you know, in the um, public health arena up here. So feel free to ask any of the commissioners up here, any of uh, your thoughts, issues, and as we move through the year, uh, more details on your projects. Okay, so thanks guys for joining us. Uh, we'll go on to some um, new business. I think uh, I'm gonna have to switch things around a little bit. I understand that Mr. Way couldn't make it tonight, Mr. Crowdy, is that correct? No, but okay. if we um, care to have him visit us, okay. no, he's not here. He is not here. Okay. But if we rescheduled to Thursday, which is the night I invited him to come and present, I'm sure he'd be delighted. Okay. No, screw up. He's not here. Okay. But you guys will be able to give us some discussion about West Nile, and then we have yes. I someone else to talk to. Joan as well, and myself. Too. Okay. Joan, is anybody? Is I don't see Claudia Kent. Okay. Okay. She's so. supposed to be here. I left a message oh, to So we'll, we'll be. Um, you know, I, I was going to say, cause, because I didn't see the, the curator from Haverford College, to wait a little longer to see if we want to kind of see if she comes in or if you guys want to present. I'll, we'll just go through a couple things first, and then we'll get to that. So, okay. So last meeting we had talked a bit about um, there's going to be a presentation this month on West Nile virus, uh, certainly an issue that affects our, our township um, health. Um, so we'll get to that in a few seconds. In the meantime, um, I think that we'll go first to an issue that was brought up last month, which was the Ready for 100. Um, program and um, um, maybe do you want to say a couple words about this again, Ms. Piling or Ms. Maybe Nancy? Okay. I'll, uh, okay. I'll introduce it. Fine. If uh, people who were not here last time look at the minutes, you'll see an introduction to the topic of Ready for 100. It's uh, the topic of switching our public uh, facilities in the township to renewable energy sources by 2035, conducting an audit of energy use and sources in the town in our public buildings. We posted on the website last month a personal assessment of energy use. And uh, I would like to introduce Sarah Pillings, who has a couple of announcements. While she's walking up to the mic, I will say that um, ultimately we hope in the next month or two that this board will recommend to our commissioners that they endorse Ready for 100. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> I'm Sarah Pilling, 29 Garrett Avenue, Rosemont. Uh, yes, the Ready for 100 is 
government down and residents up. So we're going to be urging, coercing, suggesting, inviting personal individuals who live in Radnor Township to look at their carbon footprint, look at their energy use, and I really appreciate the fact that Linda, you suggested that go up on the website. It is there, and I now have a couple of commissioners who are willing to do more, and now I can just refer them to the link. It really is a great way to find out what you're doing, what you're not doing, and oh, I hadn't thought about that. So we are moving ahead. Uh, last week, Haverford Township passed their resolution, and so did East Bradford Township in Chester County um, Bridgeport introduced it. It hasn't passed, but Bridgeport introduced it at their last meeting. So, sort of like a snowball, it's beginning to roll downhill. And it does make perfect sense, particularly after the IPCC report came out, which gives us 10 or 20 years until we're in deep trouble. So it, Philadelphia is very active. They're working on it. Montgomery County is very active. So I have two things I wanted you to know about. <clears throat> the first is the Philadelphia chapter of Ready for 100 um, is doing a program next Wednesday from 6 to 9 at the landmark Americana Tap and Grill, which is at 2481 North 54th Street. That's just off of City Line on 54th. That's right where St. Joe's comes in. Uh, he's a practicing ga gastroenterologist for Mainline Health, and he's going to talk about how changing global environment is affecting our health, nutrition, water quality, and access for Pennsylvania residents. I'm going to go to it just to gather information. The other is an opportunity, and I've just received a email from Greg Vitale, who is my state rep. On Sunday, November 4th, from noon to 5, no registration, no money, no nothing. Um, Penn Environment, ready for 100 in, in Delaware County. Uh, who else? Variety of other groups. I'm trying to think who it is. Um, are putting on an expo. Oh, Montgomery County, ready for 100, because Haverford's in Montgomery County and Delaware County. Um, local experts on renewable energy conservation, local energy businesses are having a big expo, which is a great way to gather information. It's on Haverford College's campus. And I really would like to encourage people to go down and look. They will even do individual consultations. This is what I'm doing. This is where I live. This is what my exposure is. What can I do? Um, so uh, Robin and I came to you last month through Dr. Schartz Hopko. We're going to the EAC in November. And we've already talked to Matt Holtzman, who is the chair of the Radnor Township EAC. They're very enthusiastic. So they are intending to write a letter of support. We're going to go about this two ways, bottom up through the grassroots and top down. Informally, the, uh, the uh, assessment is that right now we have five out of seven commissioners saying yes. So. Um, uh, we think it's a done deal, hopefully. Nancy very nicely wrote a whereas we're using Haverford Townships as a model for the resolution, and I sent it to Nancy, and I will send it to you, Dr. Foreman. Uh, Nancy added a whereas definitely for public health because it has to be included. Having, as an older person, even with air conditioning in my house, this summer was miserable. And I can't imagine that it's good for a privileged person who has air conditioning and can get outside in Radnor Township. I cannot imagine what it's like in a brick row house in the city of Philadelphia. So we really appreciate uh, Radnor's Board of Health being open to this. And we'll just keep moving. Thank you.
And just for an FYI for the students, um, just to let you guys know, so our job as the Board of Health is to usually make recommendations to the Board of Commissioners about public health uh, initiatives and things that we feel are uh, good for public health. And we can actually legislate that, but the Board of Commissioners legislates and we make recommendations. So people coming to our board presenting these things, we debate as a board whether it's something that we think was, is good for public health and make the uh, recommendation to the Board of Commissioners so there can be a resolution in law change. So, or, you know, changes in the, uh, in the, uh, townships rules so this seems fairly no-brainer but we're going to get um, you know into some more of the details of everything and probably in the November meeting we can uh, discuss the actual wording of our recommendation if we if we do uh, seek to approve it okay so thank you very much Sarah and thank you Nancy for that um, I think that maybe we'll move right into the your next little thing about the gas leaf blowers because I think this will be again something that will probably think about for the month and discuss in November for discussing if we want to make a resolution about this one as well. Uh, last year, uh, we had an initial presentation, which was really excellent, about um, pollution from leaf blowing equipment um, in the township and uh, a little bit about the particulate matter that they eject as well as the uh, noise pollution that, they, uh, that they, they have as well. So we've had time to um, discuss uh, the issue, I, in July, I shared with fellow board members some materials that I had uncovered. I know Mr. Crotty was going to try to find some economic impact data. All I had was anecdotal, so I don't, I don't know if you uncovered any amazing new findings. But, um, but I thought that um, with Dr. Foreman's encouragement, it was time to put a recommendation out there for us to consider. So here it is. Uh, in light of evidence about health hazards associated with older model gas leaf blowers related to noise level as well as emissions and dispersal of particulate matter and having reviewed various strategies for reducing health risks, we recommend that the Board of Commissioners regulate gas leaf blowers as follows. Model year tw 2007 or newer and producing 65 decibels of noise or less and that use be restricted between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. I, th I would envision this being enforceable by complaint as with our chicken policy. Um, so if somebody calls up and complains that there's noisy leaf blowing going on or early morning leaf blowing or late night leaf blowing going on, then we can ask them to bring in their machine. But um, it seemed in the literature that newer model machines took care of the most egregious of the problems. So. I looked at other resolutions in other cities in California, New York, Massachusetts, and this was kind of what they do. So that'll kind of be on the record. I think we'll um, debate this a bit, you know, if I email this month. I know sometimes we're, we're sort of looking uh, for that balance between, you know, a health recommendation and sort of um, imposing uh, sort of our will on, on the public. Uh, there's obviously many different people who use these products in our community in addition to residents who may have have older models and machines. There's also uh, multiple you know, uh, lawn service companies that make their way into our township every single day um, with this equipment as well. And I'm pretty sure the township uses them for um, collection of leaf in the streets. So this is a pretty, um, it's going to affect a lot of different folks in, in the community. So I think it has to be that, again, that balance between, um, you know, over-regulating and, um, you know, the health of the community. Yeah, so thank you so much, Nancy. We'll Question. This a bit further fire. Um, do most people, do you think, uh, know just how much noise their, their leaf blowers are uh, generating? I mean, is the, the measure of 65 DBAs, I mean, is, is that a huge amount of noise and most would most people know that they're close to above or way above 60 i just I'm, you have to pick a number i'm I, I know but you know what does it mean to i was kind of going by the model year being the key that before that they were they were not regulated in any way and after that they were so i don't know that we're going to take it into a sound chamber and test the decibels, but um, it seemed like if it were a newer model machine, 
they're doing what the is, best I they mean, can. is that a piece of information that comes on the side of the pack? You know, when you go to Home Depot to buy one, it has there on the side. Oh, I don't know. This thing is making this much noise. Or, I don't know. You know. I just, I don't know if this is germane or not, but I just read in some restaurant views, reviews in the Inquirer last weekend that the, the recommended noise level in a restaurant is 70 deci 75 decibels, and they rated a couple places at 80 or 85. Mm -hmm. And I can't translate between gas blowers and noisy restaurants, but... Um, I just have two questions. This is great, Nancy. Would the hours be the same on Saturday, Sunday as well? Well, you know, I, I thought about that, but I think we need to talk about that. I mean, lots of people can only <laughs> only do their chores on the weekend. I thought about s making Sundays quiet, but lots of people can only do their chores on the weekend. And you have lots of lawn service folks that, uh, how do we regulate that? And that's, that's, a, that's difficult, uh, you know, to, to legislate. And certainly spring and summer are going to be different. I mean, you know, you're not going to blow your leaves much past 6 p.m. Uh, this time of year. But certainly in the summer when it's late until, you know, 8 or 9, you can get some lawn work done in the evenings. But you know. I wonder, too, my um, other concern with the leaf blowers, and maybe, you know, maybe this would be an area for police enforcement. But, you know, I've had near accidents by having, you know, driving and then just this whoosh of leaves and dust gets blown right in front of my car and it's it's downright dangerous and you know and also people with the leaf blowers like these big lawn services and they you know there's a truck that has you know five people with leaf blowers and they're kind of they're in the street they're here they're there and the whole thing is just this whole chaotic thing that cars are then trying to navigate through safely so I I don't know if that's something that should be addressed. I, I have a hard time imagining that, that we're able to address how companies do their business. I, I don't know. I mean, well. Okay. If I may, uh, actually, a lot of the things you just mentioned, June, uh, could be addressed if you called and complained. Uh, the, they're not supposed to block streets. They're not supposed to blow the debris into the street. And that is an outgrowth of, uh, nowadays, the MPDES permitting, uh, because they will wash to the gutters and into the streams. Uh, so a lot of that, if you called right today and complained, you would probably get some reaction. OK. So there will be some more debate on this one, and we'll discuss this again in November. So I guess we'll move on to the, um, to the West Nile virus uh, uh, presentation, if you guys have uh, a moment to start that up, Mr. Crowdy and, and uh, Dr. Capuzzi. Fine, so my apologies that um, Jeffrey Way isn't with us. Um, I'm going to have to try and uh, address some of the topics that he would address, but I, um, Joan is going to concentrate on most of the um, true science. Um, my background being in uh, health information, I'll um, go through some data. Lovely sexy, exciting data. Um, history of the West Nile virus. I better stay close to this thing. I, yeah. um, OK, first, first identified in 1937 in uh, the West Nile province of Uganda, which I think we'll show you a map later on. We'll show you where it is, uh, fairly central um, uh, Africa. It was then spotted again. Next time it's spotted outside of Uganda was Israel in 1953. It spread into southern Europe by 62. And by 1999, uh, it had somehow hitched a lift all the way to New York. Whether it's New York City or New York State, 
it got here in 1999, 62 cases confirmed by the CDC in 1999. In Pennsylvania, the first cases were identified in birds and mosquitoes and a horse. I don't know why the website mentions a horse, but you know, horses do, are actually a, a fairly major part of the West Nile virus story. That was 2000. By 2002, in almost every state in America, somebody had been recorded with West Nile virus disease. Um, it still hasn't reached Alaska, but it's reached most of the, virtually all of the other states. Um, in 2003, which is really quite a long time back, the um, incidence of West Nile virus disease in humans peaked in America. That was the peak year. Um, and in, what was the, 237 uh, were recorded in Pennsylvania. I mean, I guess since 2003, we have in some sense got our, uh, got our act together. In fact, from 2000, um, the states uh, established budgets and uh, initiatives to deal with the West Nile virus. So th they, they were aware of it in 2000, but um, they were clearly not well equipped to deal with it uh, as soon as 2003. Skip through to from 2008 on to today, um, again to try and put some sort of scale and perspective on this thing, there have been 183 cases of West Nile virus uh, in people identified in Pennsylvania. So. You know, 183 over 10 years, roughly um, 20 a year. This year, the most recent uh, data, which was published, I think, 9th of October, we've actually had a fairly, well, a very dramatic jump. From around 20 a year, we've got 72 confirmed cases of West Nile virus in Pennsylvania. So, um, I, the long, wet summer uh, certainly contributed to it. But um, that's a little bit of history. Put Pennsylvania in context. Um, again, as I said, 2003, and these are numbers from the CDC, in 2003, that was the peak year across America. I mean, things have gotten somewhat better since then. The years are in chronological order rather than uh, the magnitude of, of the impact. Um, but as you can see, from that peak, generally coming down fairly steadily. Um, in the last you know, 2017, the last full year, we have numbers for just over 2,000, and that's pretty much what it's been for the last five or six years. This year, we only have data through to the 2nd of October, so um, that's 1,611. It will rise probably up to around 2,000, but the big question is that actually, are we going to see on a national scale the kind of spike we've seen in Pennsylvania, that not likely, given that you know, already uh, we, we, we have data through to the beginning of October, that's not going to jump. The Pennsylvania number is three times its, its normal annual number. That number, 1,600, isn't going to jump to 4,800. It might do, but it seems unlikely. Total incidence of um, West Nile virus in uh, all of American citizens from it's first been identified in 99 to now is just under 50,000 people. So it's 50,000 people since 1999. That's a bit of, again, trying to get the scale of this thing. And as a state, we actually do pretty good uh, in terms of containing the, the West Nile virus. Um, California, not surprisingly, it's the biggest state in, in, in the union. Um, it has less than its fair share, if, if you actually looked at the numbers, because um, let me figure out what the numbers are. As, as a state, they have 21% of the population, but only 13% of the reported cases. Uh, if you want to get West Nile virus, if you really want to experience it, move to Colorado. Um, Colorado has, you know, it has 11% of all cases of West Nile virus reported since uh, 99, it has 2% of the US population. 
So the, the incidence amongst that population, very high. I haven't done enough research to figure out why Colorado, with all its mountains, um, should, should have such high incidence. And Texas, again, is big. Everything's big in Texas. But um, they've got 9% of our population, and they've got 11% of our West Nile cases. We do pretty well, as I said. We've had 559 cases confirmed. Um, that's 1% of all reported cases. And we have 4% of the population. So I mean. 4% of the population, 1% of the West Nile virus cases. So if somebody's doing a pretty good job, our mother nature has been very kind to us, whichever you wish. Um, OK, this year. These are the most recent uh, data points. And Delaware County, we are the state champions. We have more West Nile positive mosquitoes being ident captured and identified here in the year to date. It's a lot of uh, mosquito, po positive uh, mosquitoes. Compare it to some of the others. Um, it's still pretty high level. Yeah, question? I'm sorry, this is Delaware County. This is Delaware County. We're right in the middle of Delaware. Well, we're in Delaware County. Um, 198, again, to put that, I mean, the, the, the state champions, the state average, and it's a fairly dangerous number, that, that average, is about 38. So when you want to figure out, is 198 a lot? Yes, it is a lot. It's way higher than the 38 uh, average across all of the counties in Pennsylvania. But the good news, if you look up at positive uh, identification of, of the disease in humans, there are only three this year. Um, and that's a fairly typical year. So remember, there's a lot of West Nile virus uh, positive mosquitoes this year. We are the county that has more of them being identified and measured than anywhere else. But we only have three cases of humans recorded positive with a West Nile virus. Philadelphia has 11, you know, fewer, mos fewer infected mosquitoes than us, but you know, four times the number of people infected. Well, that's just playing with statistics because there are a lot more people in Philadelphia than there are in Delaware County, and I, you've had enough uh, statistics. But one of the things that maybe isn't quite evident from this, one of the reasons I would suggest that, that uh, Delaware does rather better than Philadelphia is that we have far more natural predators for the uh, West Nile virus. And, and those are things like dragonflies, um, things like bats, and a lot of birds, uh, including ducks and geese. So this thing, it's 50,000 cases since people first spotted it. It's over quite a number of years. Yes, it's an issue, but um, you know, we're doing a good job in Delaware of containing the problem, a decent job. Uh, I think we should be fairly proud of that. Now it's Joan's turn. Okay, so can I ask a question? Sure. <clears throat> why, why, do, <clears throat> why would you have to do this? Why would you, I would think that Philadelphia County, excuse me, <clears throat> would have a low incidence. They don't have as much grass. They don't have as many predators natural predators of, for, for mosquitoes. So why would they have such a high, nu that as high a number as they do? I can understand like Chester County, Delaware County, green areas, mm -hmm. they don't get thrown up. Standing water is, oh. is the single biggest one. Um, you know, uh, old tires, is, is everybody knows about old tires. Don't leave them lying around to, to oh. capture standing water. And you know, sources, small puddles, you get lots of mosquitoes. Thank you. Oh. Sorry. No, it's because it's being recorded. <laughs> so, just to recap sort of how the diaspora of West Nile virus, it originated here in Uganda where the Nile originates and kind of went up here, Egypt and Israel and Mediterranean and as, as Paul said through 
Europe, and then here in 1999. Sorry. So this is the virus. Um, it's an arbovirus, which is an arthropod-borne virus. The arthropod, uh, arboviruses are, are from insects. And the type is a flavivirus, which is a single-stranded RNA virus. The flaviviruses are divided into tick-borne and mosquito-borne. And mosquito-borne flaviviruses that affect people are dengue, Japanese encephalitis virus, Spondyveri, yellow fever, um, Zika uh, sh should also be on there, um, and then West Nile virus. So I, I don't think the capsid is actually purple, but I picked that image because it's my favorite color. Mm -hmm. um, transmission to people, main, main mode of transmission, route of transmission is mosquito bites. And then some uncommon causes, um, blood transfusions, organ transplantation, and they do, they do testing for this with um, blood, blood products. Um, needles, shared needles, and um, also from um, mother to fetus, although that's not an uncommon, that's not a common cause. Um, Symptoms, the incubation is two to five days after infection, and the symptoms are fever, headache, muscle pain, abdominal pain, GI issues, rash, um, lymphadenopathy, and then, of course, the, the main issue is it's very neurotropic. So it goes, it can, go, can in, the wor in the most severe cases, go into the nervous system and it causes encephalitis, meningitis, it's rare, but it's 5% of affected people will get this. In Pennsylvania, there were three out of 72, three deaths this year out of 72 cases. And basically the running average from when it first came to the US to now in, in, in the whole country is about 4%. So this three out of se three deaths a mortality rate of 4% in this figure holds true um, nationwide and since it's been diagnosed. About 4% of people who get it will die. Um, the duration of symptoms is three to six days. Um, mortality rate is highest in those over 60. But the important thing about people is people are dead end host. So. Sorry, I went out of order. Um, so people, horses, this is the life cycle. We start with the mosquito. Mosquito infects the bird, bites the bird, infects it, and then other mosquitoes are, then become infected when they um, bite the same bird. And then they spread to other birds. So it goes full cycle, and then the other, and, and they can bite, they, they will um, feed off of any mammal, but most frequently humans and horses. But people are a dead end host. So an infected person cannot infect more mosquitoes. Only birds can. Um, so in people, it's diagnosed with, uh, excuse me, in mosquitoes for testing, it's diagnosed in mosquitoes by PCR on the ground, mosquito extract RNA. In people, antibodies, ELISA, PCR. Um, IgM is uh, evident seven days after clinical signs. And the treatment is supportive care. Um, we don't use antivirals. There is an interferon in development. And there are vaccine trials um, by the NIH that began in 2015. So there may be a vaccine available. Horses account for 97% of non-human mammalian infections. Not sure why, maybe because they're so big, maybe because they're outdoors in fields where there are mosquitoes. Um, it's the leading cause of arbovirus encephalitis in horses, West Nile virus. 
Mortality rate is 33%. It's very high, but horses are really, very delicate. Anything will kill them. 40% um, of them survive, but with residual neurological deficits. Uh, there is a core vaccine that's, that is recommended for all horses. There are four licensed vaccines. Um, in Pennsylvania, there were over 50 West Nile virus positive horses in 2018, primarily um, in, uh, Amish or Mennonite owned, uh, and, and generally because they don't, they don't, they don't vaccinate. This population doesn't vaccinate. This, um, the puppy mill, <laughs> the puppy mill population also doesn't vaccinate their horses. Uh, and an important thing to know about horses: again, dead end host. So if another mosquito, if, if they um, and infected horses cannot transmit it to mosquitoes, do not contribute to the infection rate among mosquitoes. However, the definitive host is birds. So West Nile virus has been identified in over 300 bird species worldwide. Uh, they achieve adequate viremia to infect biting mosquitoes, unlike people and horses. Experimental infection has been, um, has produced a West Nile virus competent um, immunization in blue jays, grackles, finches, crows, house sparrows. So what this means is that they're commonly affected and they commonly survive. So they're big ones in, in, in infecting the mosquito population. Um, in Pennsylvania, the most common birds that are positive are corvids, which are crows, grackles, um, starlings, um, also blue jays, raptors, and grouse. It actually has affected the grouse hunting season. Um, 1999, the New York City outbreak in 1999 was tracked very closely with the avian death. So if you remember, you know, everyone was spotting dead birds around then and turning them into authorities. Um, the preferred bird uh, of the West Nile virus mosquitoes in Pennsylvania are the passerines. These are perchers, songbirds and um, <clears throat> crows. The mosquito life cycle is four stages. Three of them are in water. The eggs hatch in two days, and then they go from larvae to pupae, which are both um, water stages in five to seven days. So from egg to adult, seven to 10 days, that all happens in water, and they, they lay multiple um, batches of eggs, each mosquito, in a season. This is an egg raft, um, and they float in the water. It's multiple rows. It's a column and then multiple rows stuck together. You may have seen them. Uh, these are the larvae and the, the common name that they're known by, by entomologists is wigglers. Um, they do not do well in moving water. They're not good swimmers. So as you can imagine, stagnant water is a problem. Um, if, if you don't remember anything else from this presentation, this is what's important. This is a male mosquito. They don't, they don't bite. They, they're actually the good guys. They, they, they help pollinate, believe it or not. Um, kill them anyway, <laughs> but they do, they, they feed only on flower and nectar. And the interesting thing is this proboscis is feathery and it makes a buzzing sound. So if you hear a buzzing mosquito, it's not going to bite you. <laughs> the lifespan is a week. The female, the female is, has a straight proboscis, silent. They do feed on um, flower nectar and, you know, sugar. Um, and they are the blood suckers. And they live about two weeks. So male or female? Female. Um, there are 3,000 mosquito, species of mosquito, um, excuse me, not in Pennsylvania, in the world. <laughs> there are 63 species in Pennsylvania. The ones that are a problem, the main one is the common house mosquito, Culex pipiens, and it's also the main 
the main species in Delaware County. So if you encounter a mosquito in Delaware County, it's likely to be a potential West Nile virus carrying mosquito. And then the, there are two other collect species. 10% um, of trapped QLX test positive in Pennsylvania. 2018, it was 35%. So probably because of had something to do with the rain. Um, this is a QLX. They have a striped uh, abdomen. Prevention. So to prevent mosquito bites, I think everybody knows these preventive measures. DEET. Um, I'm not. I'm not a fan of anything that has too many, you know, organic compounds. But I don't think it's safe. But that is the that is the primary way to prevent mosquito bites. Uh, and it doesn't kill mosquitoes. It just repels them. Picaridin, which is another chemical, um, IR3535. No idea what that is, but it, it sounds like a heavy hitter. <laughs> Oil of lemon eucalyptus sounds good, but I don't know if it works. Paramethane diol and some other things. Protective clothing, stay indoors. Um, this is Delaware County right here. So as you can see, it's, it's in a hotbed of waterways, and <clears throat> that is what we need, we need for mosquitoes. That's why it's such a problem in Delaware County. <clears throat> um, stagnant water, we don't want stagnant water. Uh, this is a bubbler system, and this is one way of, of preventing, of decreasing the mosquito population to keep water moving. So although we have a lot of creeks, which are not really conducive to, um, to mosquito breeding, there are obviously out, outcroppings of stagnant water along the creeks, and there are ponds all over the place. So, Water bubblers are, are a good way to prevent uh, mosquito development. Um, other environmental reduction ways of preventing mosquitoes, um, creating ecosystems. Frogs, frogs will, will eat mosquitoes as well as the other life stages that are in the water. Um, aquatic beetles will as well. Um, aerial predators like dragonflies, damselflies. So where you see um, ponds or waterways that have the nitrogen-loving plants like cattails, um, those are generally complete ecosystems where you're going to have enough natural predators to, to kill the life stages of the mosquito. BTI dunks, um, this is a bacillus. You can get it at, at I mean, homeowners can, can get it at, you know, Home Depot, Lowe's, and they somehow kill the, um, they, they're put in water and they can s somehow kill the larvae. And then chemical spraying, auto dissemination traps, which these, these are used by licensed applicators. The chemical is polyproxifen, which is very effective, um, and the brand is into care. Pennsylvania assistance. Um, so the state, the state of Pennsylvania does provide assistance for each county. They do a scope of work plan for each county, and it's based on um, their measurements of um, their vector mat matrix, which is a measurement of population. The county submits a grant application to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Um, they identify six sites that get, are going to get tested weekly. And so catch basins trap the adults, larval, there's larval surveillance, and then from that they determine larval control methods, water-based, and then um, spraying. And they spray synthetic pyrethroids from trucks. The spray, um, spray is tiny droplets that do not stick to foliage. And, and get caught in the windrift. So they, it disseminates, but it doesn't penetrate the woods very well. So you know, if you've walked in like um, Skunk Hollow, I mean, it's full of mosquitoes right after spraying because the sprays just don't, don't get in there. So I, I don't know that, that they do that much good in a lot of the places where 
the mosquitoes are the worst. Um, okay. Um, Joan referenced uh, BTI. What, one of the really good things about that is it's, it is very selective. I don't know how it got to be so selective, but all, all it kills is mosquito larvae and black fly, some sort of black fly larvae. So it, it is very safe around streams because it will not harm uh, fish. It doesn't, in fact, it harms only really the mosquitoes. So that's that's, uh, that's, that's a, a good way of, of dealing with the larva, okay? But it's only good for um, preventing the larva growing to become an adult mosquitoes. Um, and I, I, when, I, when I first heard about West Nile virus and, you know, yet another reason, you know, along with deer ticks, why I shouldn't go in my backyard during the summer, and, and honest to God, folks, if you, if you look at any of the websites that give you advice about West Nile virus, or if you read your newspaper, uh, one of the really constructive ideas they give you for avoiding getting West Nile virus is to stay indoors. And that really is not a, a hugely practical uh, answer. But, you know, try and keep some of the numbers in perspective. Um, very few mosquitoes are actually uh, infected with the West Nile virus. I should be able to give you a number. I can't. Maybe by next time I will. Um, the other thing to understand is of the 20% um, of people who are, are bitten by uh, a, an infected mosquito who do actually show the, uh, the symptoms, um, only one in 150 um, actually develop very severe illnesses. Um, and we do, as a state, I think I said earlier, since 2000, we've actually put some money into dealing with, uh, with, with these, the West Nile vi virus. Um, the season for the West Nile virus is, in Pennsylvania anyway, generally it's from April to October. Um, for us in Delaware County and another eight, nine, or ten uh, counties, the, the job of trapping and testing and treating um, the mosquitoes has been taken on by an outfit called Penn State Extension. Um, so it's it, it basically uh, a bunch of guys down at Penn State here in, um, I think they're down in media. Um, but they have been doing it for us. We have in Delaware three certified public pesticide applicators. Um, Jeffrey uh, was, is the guy who is supposed to be here presenting tonight. He leads that team. He's led it for a while. Um, the bad news is, I mean, I, I think the numbers say they've been doing a pretty good job in Pennsylvania and a very good job in Delaware. The bad news is that Penn State has decided it wants to get back into the education business and not into the West Nile virus uh, identification and treatment business. So they're out of, the, uh, out of this business at the end of this year, effectively the end of October. So Delaware is going to have to hire, train, educate these people. And th there's going to be a bit of a ramp up. They're going to have to figure out where the real hotbeds are with, within Delaware. Um, and I don't know why I threw this number up, but um, you saw already the incidence of um, West Nile positive mosquitoes is, is jumped from about 20 to 70 this year. Well, with that has gone an increase in uh, the number of control events that these guys at uh, Penn State Extension have been doing for us. So they've been, they've been working harder to contain it. Um, and th this thing, since 1970, the people who deal with this problem that, that Joan took you through, um, I mean, the world and his brother is involved in, 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 in containing it. You've got the Department of Environmental Protection. They are the lead uh, outfit in, in the collaborative effort. Department of Health are involved, Department of Agriculture. And if you go on their website, they'll tell you this is, this is their mandate, this is their goal. And if you really want it, um, I can let you have copies of, of the, all of the detail. There are literally pages here. Um, it's kind of impressive. It's bureaucratic, but it's kind of impressive that it identifies the role of 
all of the people within the departments, um, what, what, who, what, who has responsibility for what and what the handoffs are. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty effective looking organization. And um, that's, that's about it from me. Uh, Joan, do you want to uh, say something about your references? Or? <laughs> no, OK. I think, um, to, to me, I think um, the danger is, and I, and I certainly did initially, I was, I was really quite worried about, oh, God, no, along with deer ticks and Lyme disease, we now have yet another menace to keep us out of our backyard. And every time I heard a mosquito buzz, you know, I thought this is, this is close to the end of the world because I'm going to get something like a horrible case of flu, only much, much worse. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the numbers, it really is not that big. A pro I don't want to make little of it, um, but it is something you got to keep in perspective. You know, the numbers, 20 people um, a year and one in 150 get very serious uh, illness from it. And, and the mortality rate is not hugely scary. I mean, if you're one of the three that dies, it, it's, a, it, it's a problem. But it's, West Nile virus is, I think, being well managed by the township. And I would say the one message from this a lot is we got to make sure that we get um, good people in to replace the people from Penn State Extension who are stepping out of this business uh, next year. And if we do, some, if we do nothing else, we should make sure that the township um, and, and the, our commissioners um, lobby hard to get good guys in that role. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you guys for that. It's really kind of another, just another reason why you know, when we joined the Board of Health, we, uh, we get to the, the privilege of hearing this, this awesome information. From a clinical point of view, I just kind of make a couple of comments, and I'm, hopefully some people up on the, on the stage will also help uh, with their clinical experience with West Nile virus. Certainly it's an underreported disease. I mean, when you guys have stated that, you know, only one in certain number of people have uh, significant symptoms from West Nile, there's got to be hundreds of cases a year, thousands of cases a year in Pennsylvania that are just not reported because it's a flu-like illness and it doesn't have any specific symptom that would, that would um, indicate to a physician, let's say at a minute clinic or a you know, primary care office to go testing for this because it goes away in about a week or 10 days. Um, similarly, arboviruses across the country um, like equine um, encephalitis and some other ones are regional to insects in, in different parts of the country. And the same thing, there's many cases that are underreported. However, those few cases that, you know, that, that advance to a, a level um, make headlines. And, and we have, you know, you'll have a younger person in the ICU with an encephalitis from one of these mosquito-borne illnesses, these arboviruses. So from a clinical point of view in a, in a, in a pediatrics office and uh, experience at the, some of the children's hospitals in the city, um, we would see a case rarely, and it usually was when a child was in the, you know, a situation where they were fairly sick, and now you're starting to draw at straws and figure out what's uh, the source of the, of the illness. Um, and so many of the kids who come in with just kind of aches and pains don't ever get the testing done. So that's one thing. And the second thing I think that for our community is to, you know, like, uh, like Paul said, it's, this is not a, a huge burden for, for death and illness. Um, the, it, is a, it is an illness in the community along with Lyme disease, and I think it's important for everybody to understand how to protect yourself the best. And of course, staying inside is a good recommendation, but not a, a very uh, you know, helpful one for us, for the folks who want to be outside. But there are some evidence, there is evidence to show, hard evidence to show that DEET does work. Um, it, has a track record of, of many years, 20, 30 years, as far as its safety goes. And, and, and I can say from reading literature about this frequently for parents, there's not a lot of reports of severe significant side effects from DEET. There has been some incidents of rapid heart rates and people who get nauseous and, and vomiting from it. But um, at the doses given uh, at cans of, of this stuff that you can buy at the supermarket, it is protective to mosquito bites. Um, there was a large article um, a few years back done, I believe it was just in a Consumer Reports, where they tested DEET versus other um, non-chemical, quote-unquote non-chemical products. I believe they tested it versus like Avon Skin So Soft uh, lotion, 
uh, and also a couple of other things. But what they concluded was that DEET and permethrin were both protective against mosquitoes and concentrated eucalyptus oil, which I believe was in your, and lemon oil was in your presentation, was almost as effective as those two products in, in yeah. So there was, but again, when we have products that aren't sort of regulated by any commissions, uh, EPA, things like this, we're getting products that may not be effective compared to what they tested in, in consumer reports. So the true um, concentration of the lemon oil and the eucalyptus oil, I'm not exactly clear on, but it was uh, almost as protective as DEET and permethrin in their study. So what residents can do, I think, is a great idea is, is if you're going outside is to wear long sleeves. Uh, if you're going to be outside for a while and it's not too terribly hot, long sleeves, long pants to protect yourself from ticks and mosquitoes. And I do encourage my patients when they have infants and children to just screen their carriages or their car seats when they're walking around outside with their children, so their babies and children, so to protect them somewhat from uh, mosquito bites without having to use any chemicals on their skin. Anybody else have any other comments? But thank you very much for that presentation. I really appreciate it. Sarah Pilling again. Um, I think an educational program would be excellent. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sort of vaguely glimpse at this next door Rosemont, and there was a tizzy this summer because they were, it's the county who does the spraying. They do the surveying, they find what they are consider the hot spots. They do release the streets where they're going to do it. But people didn't bother with that. They were sure the whole township would overlay. And they were having a tizzy over the fact that spraying was going to happen. So I think it's important to educate residents of ta the township for several things. One is don't leave standing water. Use the dunks. You can use a cooking oil and float it on the top of a bird bath or whatever water is that you want to have, because the wigglers have to stick their proboscis up above the water in order to breathe, and you smother them with the oil, and you use canola or something very simple like that that will do it. But mostly, people need to empty out containers, and this summer, it was extremely difficult. I had more mosquitoes in my house than I knew what to do with. And what I discovered, because I got pretty tough skin, was I became sensitized to it. And every mosquito bit me, and everyone raised a wheel. So it became, it became a real issue. And in the heat and the humidity this summer, I'm not about to wear long pants and a long shirt. So I think education-wise would really help whoever it is, the young mothers who are just ballistic. A question I have is if you get West Nile once and it's a subclinical case, if you get it again, what happens? And I say this because unfortunately, well, fortunately I spent many years going to Haiti. Unfortunately, the first year I got dengue, it was a subclinical case and I didn't know it. But when the second time I got dengue, I was in Lankanal Hospital for five days, lost 20 pounds in a week, could not walk, and was told three weeks later, because the testing has to go to California, that if I ever went to Haiti again or if I ever got dengue, I'd have hemorrhagic dengue and I'd die. So, the, so of course I went. I mean, you know, come on, I'm not going to not go. I was, we were educating children, sending children to school, and we were doing empowerment program with women, and that was far more important than Sarah staying away from the dengue mosquitoes. Um, but so my question is, can you get West Nile more than once, and is it club, because I know from my reading, it's uh, most of the cases, as you said, are subclinical a headache or muscle aches, and if you work in a garden, who doesn't get muscle aches? But does it build up if you're rebitten? And I don't know that anybody knows that. 
and I find it interesting. I understand why Penn State Extension would do all the identifying, et cetera. But I find it sort of interesting that Delaware County does it, but Delaware County doesn't have a Department of Health. So uh, I, th I think, and I was trying to find that too, I think the IgG, the protective antibodies, do wane with time. So I, I think you can get it. Um, I, I, th I think you can. And I suspect you one can of the too. things that I read indicated that you can, but I, do, I can't say for sure. Do you know? And without a direct link, guys, with climate change, we're going to get more of this because we now have dengue in the southern states, whereas it, Puerto Rico was as far north as it came. And let me tell you, it's a really nasty disease. It's not called break bone fever for nothing. Thank you. But let's educate. I think it's a great idea. I am all for education. Um, I, the only, uh, Joe, not the only experience I have with um, West Nile actually is PCR identification and spinal fluid. So I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, waning titers or, or even an IgM or IgG to, to this. So it's different. I guess it's a bit different because when they're taking, when the kids are that sick and they're and they're they're looking for West Nile, they're usually doing PCRs of um, spinal fluid. So, but great, great presentation. I think that um, it might be interesting for Mr. Way to come out at some point, Paul, and just kind of give us a little bit of feedback on the chemical they use, kind of, you know, like, like you said, talking about regional areas they spray and stuff. It might be interesting and, and educational for the, for the community to hear that. So something to think about for the future. I appreciate you guys putting that presentation together. Yeah, the sad news about not having him here tonight is that October, I think, is his last month with the, uh, with the program. Um, but I, I, I do think the, the township does need to be aware that uh, Delaware is now um, taking over, not by any choice of theirs. I mean, they're, they're very happy with the work that uh, PE Extension has done. But, um, you know, we, we've had guys doing good work on our behalf. And um, I think education, absolutely right. Education is the absolute priority. I mean, if you spending a hundred bucks, I would think you want to spend 80 on uh, education and then 20 on treatment. Um, but unfortunately, Jeffrey is no longer with us after the end of this month, so sorry. So we'll be, okay. A couple of just a quick announcements for everyone. I guess you're all aware that it is flu season, so please go out and get your flu vaccinations for the entire community. Um, they're basically the same everywhere you go. If you go to the uh, CVS, to the Minute Clinic, to your doctor's office, to the you know hospital drives, to township drives, it's all the same basic vaccination. The flu vaccine, uh, the injectable flu vaccine cannot cause the flu. It is a dead virus, and I reinforce this to everybody at all times that you can't get the flu from the flu vaccine, so please get it done. It's not always a great match uh, to the strain that's in the community, but it does give you a layer of protection uh, to a disease that is um, certainly much more common than West Nile virus and certainly can be much more deadly and certainly is much more uh, painful to many people when they do get it because it lasts a solid 10 days of being feel, feel, feeling like you were beaten up by a, a ball peen hammer and coughing your, your guts out. So good idea to get the vaccination rather than that. Uh, real quick second would be um, just again, education awareness for everybody. Last year, we, I spoke a bit about um, acute flaccid paralysis, which is a virus that uh, is probably an enterovirus, which has been infecting communities uh, across the U.S. At, at, at different times of the year. We're not exactly sure if it's a seasonal thing, uh, but there's been more cases reported this year in Minnesota um, and another outbreak. I've believe in Wyoming was it? I can't remember what state it was, but there's been uh, more of these. This is a polio-like illness that's uh, finding its way back uh, into the United States again. Um, so just if people hear this on the news, um, to, to understand that um, uh, the CDC is, has been on this for a little while, and this year there has been another uptick in that, that disease. Um, anybody else with any other announcements? Uh, as everybody knows, we always have the, uh, the drug drop-off box here in the township building, so if you have any older expired medicines that you don't want sitting in your house, you can always bring them to the drug drop-off box here in the township building. So the next Board of Health meeting is scheduled for Monday, November 19th at 5.30 p.m. in this room. Uh, we will meet again then and discuss a couple of our resolutions. Thanks for coming, everyone. I have one thing I'd like to add is, is, is health related. Yes, um, before I smack. Radnor Police will be doing a firearms and ammunition uh, surrender. People come in and turn them in, and then they, the police get them destroyed. Uh, I believe it's the 20th, but I'll, it's on the web. We can check it there. 
and then I guess also that next weekend is the recyclable, and that's good for the community too. If we get our recyclables that are shouldn't be thrown in the trash cans out to the community uh, to this place uh, with your I guess with your identification that you're a Radnor Township uh, resident. Thanks so much. Have a good night, everyone.